Sunday, everybody, and welcome back to the Couchside Judges. I'm Scott Fontana. Follow me on Twitter at Scott underscore Fontana. And I'm Dan Urban. Follow me at the Dan Urban. Follow the podcast at Couchside Judges and subscribe to us everywhere, including YouTube. That's right. And if you like this show, give us that five star review. And as always, we taught judging in MMA, so you should head over to abcboxing.com and read the scoring criteria. Dan, we had uh, ourselves uh, quite a crowd watching the action in Columbus for the hey. UFC on Saturday. Herb Dean got the loudest pop of the prelims. Is that right? I didn't yeah. even. I didn't actually catch that. I forget what fight it was, but he they like they announced Herb Dean would be the ref, and the crowd went nuts. And uh, weird. And uh, John does, does does he have like an Ohio cra- connection? I, they don't know about. I don't, I, I, don't know. I I was of the um, impression, and maybe maybe falsely, that he is a California guy. I do. Yeah, I thought he was a California guy as well. I don't know. I'm sure one of our listeners can set us straight. Uh, but... Although I do remember his school at that one point. I thought was in New Mexico. Oh, okay, I could be wrong on that. Still not very close to Ohio. No, no, we're we're, we're pretty far away. Um, and and uh, as as I pointed out to uh, Sean Sheehan on Twitter, Ohio is not very close to Denver. <laughs> It, it, look, I, I'm not even laughing. I'm not laughing at the man. He doesn't know U.S. geography, and I don't expect him to. So, but I, I just wanted to let him know is it was 1,800 or almost 1,900 kilometers away. Yeah, I drove. I did a road trip to Colorado, and Ohio seemed like very early in the trip. I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I've not taken that road trip. It's fun. I, I saw the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. That was cool. Mm. I would I would say you and I are taking a road trip up to Niagara, but we're going to take separate cars when we go up there for the ABC conference. Yeah, you go one way, I'll go another, and then we'll discuss how different it was. But we can't do that because you're leaving early. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean that's not set in stone, but for for I oh mean, really? Oh, that's kind of yeah, it is. But, yeah, I was just saying. I thought so. I mean, we still got a lot of time for it. Things could change. I'm saying. I think they should change. I think you should come up to ABC with me the whole time. All right, all right. I'm most interested in. Meeting some of these guys and taking the training course and passing the test. I don't even have we even really talked about the fact that we're actually like officially going yet on the show. Is, I don't did we just think like so. soft break this news? Yeah. Breaking news, everybody. Oh we, yeah. Dan and I are going to the ABC conference in Niagara uh in late July for at the very least the training sessions for refereeing and judging MMA. Uh in Dan's case. I will be there start to finish. Checking out the entire thing uh, seems newsworthy enough. I'm in media. I feel like uh, it, it's worth doing. I think probably more media should feel that way, and I hope I'm joined by others. But we'll see. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Yeah, I'm. I've been focusing on my catchphrase for the referee portion. Oh God! For when <laughs> like I don't. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that, and like, I, I maybe I'll have to. But I feel like that's not part of the training. Like I might, I might stick with you know Jamie Cruz's, you know how he starts rounds in jujitsu. Cha, get him! Oh yeah, there you go. That's a good one. So I don't know. I mean, I did think at one point going with to the death, but I think that's kind of the reason I'm there to prevent that. I imagine. So I imagine that kind of goes against <laughs> yeah. the grain. Yes. Um, and that would probably be, if not gently suggested, uh, otherwise probably told, don't you effing do that. <laughs> Most likely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and then and then you get like, I don't know, arm barred or something. I would escape. No, nah, you wouldn't. I would try to, though. I'm sure you would. I don't doubt that. Yeah, we'll see. But I am looking forward to that. Um, let's talk about UFC Columbus again. Let's, let's focus in on this. You know, we moved on from Herb Dean's pop that I didn't notice in the, in the prelims. But let's start at the top here because actually we really don't have a ton of contested rounds for this episode. We could probably keep it kind of a tighter episode on the whole, but... Um, yeah, you know, let's just start at the top. You know, talk, you know, break down the actual coming out of this event kind of thing with Curtis Blades uh, getting the stoppage of Chris Dawkins in round two in an all stand up fight, which I don't think anybody expected it would have lasted that long, and Curtis Blades wouldn't even tried to take it to the ground. I kind of got a feeling that wrestling was part of the game plan if the fight went late or went long. Interesting. That's kind of how I feel. Is that how you felt going into it or what? No, I, I'm, I'm looking back. Okay, that's kind of how I, I think. 
Yeah, we'll I mean, certainly. I mean, look, it's a trump card. He's got it. If he wasn't right. feeling good about it, then he can always go back to it. But obviously, he's been working on his stand up no, enough knows. to the point where he feels good about it to test it uh, against Chris Dawkins, who, you know, he's got dangerous uh, power in his hands, if nothing else. Does have power. Mm -hmm. So does almost everybody. I mean, at heavyweight, yeah, at heavyweight. So. It, it's true. It's true. But he has, um, he has a reputation of succeeding with this power. Yes, yes. Not I everybody love Chris at, Dawkins. Chris Dawkins not everybody at heavyweight is able to do that. We've seen our fair share of fights that have gone on far too long, uh, which is why I demand one round heavyweight fights. <laughs> uh, this one ended in the, early in the second round. I, you know, certainly can't be mad about it. And the, they're of the higher caliber uh, of heavyweight. When I when I see that. I'm always more willing to say, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, we can, I'll give you two, maybe three rounds mm. before I before I start getting mad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, Curtis Blades, it's a good win for him. Another feather in his cap. Uh, he has called for an interim title fight. Uh, I believe it was against Cyril Gann. I uh, I don't know that that's on the uh, the radar of the UFC. The, there's certainly an interim title that's going to happen because they, if they did one last year, they're going to do it again. But do you think he, Curtis Blades, should get an interim title fight next? I don't. I don't mind if he does get it. I think mm -hmm. they probably they still got to figure out what's happening with with Stipe. Is he going to come fight? Because if if he is going to come Stipe, fight, Stipe, who by the way completely ignored anything that Curtis Blades was telling him from the cage. <laughs> did you did you did you catch that? No, or did, okay, so no. yeah, so what happened was, and you missed it. You turned it off, I think. But uh, Stipe was in the crowd, of course, in Ohio. Mm -hmm. it's, it's his digs. Yep. Um, and uh, DC was trying to kind of set something up with them, and and DC <laughs> uh, and Stipe's outside the cage, and and Curtis Blaze is talking, and he's like, "Oh, you got a message for him?" And he was, and uh, Curtis was, he was very respectful, saying, you know, it, you know, that kind of thing, and then uh. Stipe is basically just like taking pictures with people and like completely ignoring it. Anytime he hears his name, he just kind of like gives a wave and keeps moving. <laughs> he was so disengaged from anything that was actually said. It, yeah. was, it was it was very funny. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, as far as interim titles go, I think it all hinges if what what's going on with Stipe. Stipe and John Jones. Uh, yeah. I, I keep forget about John Jones. They, they can't I, do anything so. with that title until they know what they're going to do with those two guys. And I mean. And then you got Aspinall wants to fight Tui Vasa. Mm -hmm. Blades. I think Blades, to, Blades to, gone for, works. For what it's worth, though, Tom Aspinall, I spoke to him on Monday, and he, he doesn't necessarily think that he has done enough to warrant a title shot, or in, even an interim title shot. He doesn't know right. that that fight should be yeah. for an interim title. But he said, you know, like, listen, if, if they come to me and they tell me it's an interim title fight, like, you start to think about it a little differently. You'd have to say, so. I mean, I also don't But think I don't that, know that they would do that. I mean, you also... You just do Blades versus Gone. I mean, there's really no reason to have, make it interim. Do five round Blades versus Gone. That I'm fine with that too. So like an unofficial interim title or tie versus in Gone. Sense. I mean, there's just I think you can go a couple different ways here with heavyweight. It's kind of at at one heavyweight's point, actually kind was, of interesting right yeah, now. Yeah, it used to be where it was top of the heap was just like there was a big distance it. between yeah. them. But now none of them fight anymore, so it's a little different. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's great. Once you just chop off the top there, it's like, oh, that was pretty interesting again. <laughs> yeah. <that'd... laughs> oh man. Uh, what about Chris Dawkins though? Like you said, he's he's a guy you like. Um, you know, I've I've spoken to him a couple times now in in the last few months, and and he's a very likable guy. He's he's a very interesting guy. Um, what do you think for him? Like, what what would you like to see for him next? If it was up to you, if it's possible, I know I know you spoke to him, and he said he actually gained weight for this fight. Yes. Like I, I kind of maybe go the other way. See, is it possible? Can you get to two hundred five or not? He, I mean, uh, I asked him not this time, but back in December before the the, the Derek Lewis fight. I said, you know, because at that point he was only like two thirty something mm -hmm. or whatever. I said, you're not that far off from what light heavyweights walk around at. Like, is is that something? He's like, yeah, you know, and and you know, he's in his mind, he really wants to focus on heavyweight. At least, again, things have now changed in between then. He's lost twice since we spoke about this. But uh, in his mind, he was kind of like, you know, maybe maybe one day if I'm able to earn the, the heavyweight title and then maybe I want to go down and try to go for that title too. And, you know, he's, he's dreaming here. I don't think he mm. was trying to um, jump the gun necessarily. I didn't take it that way and I don't think it mm -hmm. should be taken that way. But, yeah, I mean, the thought was kind of like, I'd like to accomplish what I can at heavyweight and then maybe move down and explore that. But uh, I don't think that if he committed himself to being a light heavyweight that it would be that challenging. And he doesn't seem to think it would be either. He doesn't think it would be challenging? 
No, no, I'm not. Oh, I don't. Oh. Again, I'm not putting words in his mouth, but the fact that he seemed to think it was something he could do later. Oh, okay. The, the, saying the fight, I thought you were saying that the fights wouldn't be a challenge. No, right? no, 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 no. Oh, okay. The idea of you. getting to that I weight. Got you. Okay. I think he he seems to think that that's a very realistic possibility to get to that weight. Uh, again, this is not an in, inclination or indication, excuse me, of whether he's actually planning to do that. That's going to be up to him to decide. Um. I don't I don't want to say anything unkind, but it certainly looks like he's carrying a little bit of extra weight on him that, you know, if he let's say he committed very strongly to to a diet. I know he he, he said he eats uh, organic food mm. now and, and all that kind of thing. But um, well, they got organic everything now. Yeah, 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 I think they got organic gummy bears. Although, it, yeah, at some point. Well, he said he does like these kids gummy snacks, too. He huh? told me that <laughs> uh, and he definitely likes cheesesteaks. So I don't know if those cheesesteaks are all organic, too. I, don't I know. love cheesesteaks. Uh, but uh, I mean, me, too. I, I think I actually. Yeah, I had a cheesesteak for lunch today, didn't I? Oh, yeah. From Charlie's, <laughs> which is OK. It's, it's, you know, the chain. It's it's whatever. But I, I just felt like a cheesesteak anyway. Um yeah, I could see him getting down to light heavyweight. Honestly, I'd kind of like to see that from him. I don't know that that's what's going to be the next step yet. Well, well here's, but... here's the thing. Eric Nixick made a point today. He said, did the UFC rush Dawkus? And, well... Probably. But, yeah, but who else does he fight? You come into this in a division that's shallow when he entered and start knocking people out. Sure. There's, who, who are you going to put him in? You can't just have him fight cans all the time. No, but Derek Lewis was a very gigantic that's a big jump. step that's, up. Okay. That was that was probably a bridge too far. It was Curtis Blades? I don't know, but the problem is you already put him in there with Derek Lewis, so what do you do? I mean, uh, I guess just Curtis Blades. So... My thing is that light heavyweight is is kind of getting pretty stacked right now. So, so so is heavyweight. We just talked about that. But only, but really, only at like the top five. I guess. I are, guess. Are kind of like well, top five minus, now. Minus that, yeah. So the other three. Right. So like the top eight. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> light heavyweight is great. One through fifteen. Ah. Uh, I mean, I think it's just he. Has, I don't know about that. I wouldn't also, go that far. Also, light heavyweight. Not everyone has that back pocket power. Where sure. Where one shot and it it's just lights out. Mm. I think I think he goes to two hundred five. I think he sets himself up for better success. I think he'd be so. perfectly sized for that. I I really do. I do think he can still succeed at heavyweight. Um, and I do think he's early in enough as in his career that there's still time to develop. And heavyweights have a very long life, sh- like a, a shelf life. Yeah, look at our like. yeah, yeah. Well, there's some of these guys are just a, just total exceptions to the rule because then there's also like. You know, you think of who was dominating heavyweight 10 years ago, Junior Dos Santos and Cain Velasquez. And and I don't mean this to get into a whole thing about Cain's current situation, but the fact is neither one of them is fighting for the UFC anymore and wasn't going to be. So not everybody is going to do what Andre Arlovsky does <laughs> and fight into his fourth decade for the UFC, which is absurd. Um, and, and, you know, even Overeem who fought for a very, very long time uh, to get to this point. These are exceptions to the rule. Fabrizio Verdum, another guy. Uh, I I don't know, but I still think the heavyweights can last a lot longer. DC, by the way, another guy who t- about ten years ago he was he was competing in the uh, the heavyweight Grand Prix for Strike Force, and then he's already retired too. So mm-hmm. yeah, uh, it's it's different. It's definitely different now. But I think he's he's still early early enough in his career. He's not that old. I think he's still got time to. Uh, find his way in the heavyweight division if that's what he still chooses to do but my two cents is i think he could find better success at light heavyweight that's just that's yeah where I, I think I agree. he's better I, suited I, yeah I, 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 I think the one i think the only question is could he could he if he so chose go all the way down to middleweight where his brother is i don't think well, that uh, i don't think that's ever gonna happen that's kind of that's kind of a stretch but it wasn't also i think kyle also fought at heavyweight yes yeah so, he did absolutely I mean, they 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 are built sim- very similar. But I think I think Doc is de- uh, Chris definitely has more muscle mass to him. Yeah, he so. seems he seems kind of uh, more broadly um, built, mm-hmm. you know, in his frame, which yeah. is why I do think middleweight might be a bridge too far for someone like him. He d- he's he does seem bigger than Kyle, his brother. Yeah. So, yeah, I, that's why I think light heavyweight would be kind of a good sweet spot for him. Um, but we'll see. You know, I'm I'm sure he's gonna stick it out at heavyweight for for a little while longer. Unless maybe he changes mind. I don't know. But yeah, we'll see. Uh, I don't think it would necessarily be panic button for him to go down there. I think it it would be an appropriate move. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. Uh, moving on though, in the co headliner here, Alexa Grasso tapped out Joanne Wood, nay Calderwood, in round one. That was a good finish. That was that was a nice uh, that was a nice win for yeah. Alexa Grasso. That was that was her best win. 
I, definitely. So, so I guess the question is, how close now is she to a title shot against Valentina Shevchenko? I think she's still a bit, a bit away. But I mean, but who's in the way? That's this is where, this is where yeah. you start to think about. It. I'm not saying is she ready for the challenge of actually being able to beat her because I don't think anyone is right now. But it, how close is she to actually getting that fight? When you think about everyone else who's in the division, that's the question. Well, she was supposed to fight Arujo, and then that fight fell through. Mm. Uh, but now Arujo is booked to fight Andrea Lee. So I guess the winner of that could yeah, make some sense. I kind of like that. I could see that. Uh, Taylor Santos has the next shot, right? Uh, yes, she so. does. So, uh, assuming that Valentina Shevchenko does get through yeah, this, kind of a uh, logjam up up there of fighters who've already had their opportunity, yeah, and, and failed like everyone else. So, Amanda Hibas is also fighting Caitlin Trukagian next. That is kind of interesting. That's right? an interesting one because Hibas is coming up. Well, if Hibas actually so. wins that fight, they might have to rush her to it, which I, I don't think would go well. But is they, there a be... reason she's coming up? I don't know. Did they, has she? Has she hasn't said. Couldn't tell you. Yeah. Because the thing is, I would like to see Caitlin Chukagian versus uh, Man and Fioro. F- Fioro. Man on Fior. Uh, that's a great Fior. matchup. Fior. Fior. That's, what okay. they, yeah. that's how they said it. Yeah, I think they used to say it like Fioro, which I always mm. thought sounded like the Pokemon Fioro. And that mm. was why I'd always post gifts of Fioro. <laughs> but apparently it's Fior. Fior. Okay. Fior. Man on Fioro. Or fewer. 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 So the o- the extra OT is just I didn't take for French. decoration. I did not take French. It's just decoration the last couple of letters. I don't know. I, I'm working uh, on Italian right now. I've got I've got like a, <laughs> I've currently got a six hundred day streak on um what's it called? What's the app called? Duolingo. I remember when we went to see Batman, you were like, oh, I forgot to do my Italian. Yeah, I made I sure to do it before the it. movie because I do because <laughs> the movie was gonna end afterward and I'm like, Well, I gotta do it before midnight, otherwise it resets. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. Although, not to get into it in the weeds, but there's ways I can get around that. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I honestly, I do think that they're probably going to want to put, if, if Valentina wants a fight, if, again, we'll work under the assumption that she's going to win this fight, which she may not, but mm-hmm. I'm going to work with it anyway, because I do think she will. If she wants to fight again later this year, like uh, she's going to need an opponent. So I, I would have to think that they might actually be able to put Alexa Grasso in there. She has, of course, she she's Mexican. Um, there's that angle that they kind of like to play. They they like to play to the nations and that kind of thing. So maybe there is a way uh, to do that as well from the promotion standpoint. So I don't know. The UFC doesn't really care about trying to find someone who could actually beat her. <laughs> They're just looking to make money. It's an enterprise, sir. Yeah. So it, it's true. Yeah, I could see. I could see it really. Like, yeah, I don't. I don't see the people ahead of her really getting the shot, except for Lee. Or our Ujo, depending how that goes. Yeah, but but so, again, what, where's the juice in that one? You know, from a promotional standpoint, I don't mm-hmm. know. I mean, unless unless one of them comes off with, with like a spectacular. I mean, Lee's kind of exciting. Ah, uh, two finishes in a row. Yeah, I mean, she's she's on a good run now. But is she going to make more money for the UFC? That's the bottom yeah, line. It, when it really gets down to it at the end of the day, that, which is though. what's so stupid. It's so stupid. It really is stupid that that this is the way it works. But I'm just being real here. Mm. I I know the way the UFC works, and that's very much a primary criterion. I mean, if Chukagian beats Hebus convincingly and gets a finish for once, um, or if Hebus wins, or, hey, yeah. Hebus winning is different. That's like an actual potential wild card in there. But again, I don't think any of these women are actually ready. Yeah, I don't. It, it's for the hurting that uh, that bullet can put on. Because the thing, it's like oh, Casey O'Neill at some point. At some point, That's she's it, not so. she's not quite there either. She she's got a fight lined up next. Who is she fighting? Do you remember? Um, Marcel posted it. I don't know. I will look it up though. Yeah, I, I saw this the other day, maybe even today. She's got someone on tap. That's a, it's a good matchup for her. Oh, you know what? It's Jessica I. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Jessica That's I. not gonna, she's not going to get a title shot off of that, but that that will start pushing her a little higher in the mm-hmm. division. Yeah. That's right. I do remember that. Um, but yeah, I I don't. I just I did look at the I look at the way it's shaped out and that's kind of how I see it. I do think Alexa Grasso probably realistically is in the driver's seat for that next shot. Well, yeah, consider like like you said, considering everyone ahead of her has already had a shot. That's and so, that's exactly how it works. <laughs> so, but uh, it, on the other side of flyweight and uh, in the men's side for potential title shots, Kai Carafrance got his win over Askar Askarov. It's a little fight. Nice scrap. Yeah, that was good. That mm-hmm. was a good fight. Nice rally. Did good you s- come back? Good did come back? Did you see, by the way, that uh, apparently Joe Burrow, the Bengals quarterback, uh-huh. was in the house for the fight? Really? He oh, okay. he wanted to meet Cara France after because I guess he was a fan, 
And he goes up to, um, you know, they, they, they tell Cara France later on, he's like, oh, there's someone here for you. He's like, oh, he's like, oh, hey, what's your name? Because, you know, he's not yeah. from this part of the world. And <laughs> he's talking with Megan Olivia about this. And it was like, yeah, uh, he plays for the Cincinnati. What, what's the team name? <laughs> <laughs> well, you said this rugby. Good. This is good. Yeah, exactly. It was rugby, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, that was a, this is a good win. I mean, it was a good fight. Like you said, good comeback, good win. Uh, is he the next guy at 125 pounds for the title who isn't named Figueredo or Moreno, assuming they stop after the reported fourth fight and they actually get someone else in there, unless they just keep going. Maybe it's just going to be the, the Figueredo Moreno division. It's weird. I know you, you were talking about this on your other show. The yes. Ground yes. And Pwned. The ground and pwned podcast. If you're a gamer, by the way, listen to that one as well. Um, about how this is a quadrilogy that should have been a one-off. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> so I still feel like it should have been. Uh, you know, all all respect in the world to uh, Junior Chiro Camillo, who I, I named as my best judge of last year. Uh, I strongly disagree with the round five of the original Figueroa Moreno fight having gone in the direction of Moreno. I think that's a no-brainer round for Figueroa, and that one round there is the one thing that i feel like you have to overturn and not overturn Mm -hmm. because the commission wouldn't do that but i mean the one where it's couch side overrided let's put it that way let's go with that (laughs) to to be more kind i guess uh if it if that actually happened the rest of the rounds yeah they're close so we can kind of just accept it and figure would have gotten the win and then we just moved on yeah or if if you just didn't kick them now having said that we got fantastic fights out of this so it was kind of a you know it was a dumb gift yes in in a a way (laughs) And I'm not calling Judge Camillo dumb, but, you know, kind of dumb luck, so to speak, uh, that we got great fights out of this. But, uh, yeah, it, when's the end? When are we going to get, is it, is it to break be up? Because yeah, I know it's 1-1-1. One, one, one. It technically is tied. Um, what if there's another draw, ladies and gentlemen? What if we get another draw? Are we going to get a fifth fight in a row? <laughs> Can we just do something different at that point? Like, just for the heck of it? Well, well, did I mention this before? We do. We have the world f- flyweight title, and then we have the intercontinental or the TV title. Yes, you. you I think we were talking yeah. about that last week. Yeah, we just let Brandon Marino and Figueroa uh, fight it out. Mm-hmm. Is that the now, would that be the world title or the TV title? I guess at the, at some point it becomes the TV title because it's okay. just the same fight. But... <laughs> All right. uh, or, or would this be on the off brand? UFC thing called Octagon or something like that. I'm I'm trying to because uh, mm, WWF is yeah. split. WWE is split now. I'm gonna call it WWF forever. Okay, I can't help it. <laughs> but uh, I haven't watched. I I have actually given small debate to watching WrestleMania this year. Very very small. I I also would like to watch. It's two nights though. Probably the only thing I'll do is I'll I'll be like, Yo, Dan, if you're watching. Tell me when when Stone Cold's about to come on, and then I'll turn it on. Well, so what I'm what because I don't really want to watch the whole thing. I really don't care. What I'm hearing is supposedly they're going to close out night one, Owens in Austin, with Austin demanding a match for, on night two or something like that. Okay, because it's not an actual match; it's just some kind of confrontation. Confrontation. That having. Okay. I mean, I would and still then, watch. I, I'll watch Stone Cold do things. Oh, Stone you Cold. Know? He's he's classic. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I don't I don't know as far as uh. Well, where, someone. Where were some, we anyway? Where were we? Yeah. We were talking about Kai Carafrance. Sir. Okay, <laughs> we got it to Stone Cold Steve. Austin. Yeah, I mean, it make, it's a natural segue. <laughs> if you if you at home can't figure out how we got there, just you know, even independent of memory, like, <laughs> are, do you even know us yet at this point? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, this this fight. To go back to it, we'll we'll leave everything else behind. Is he the next guy after that? Do you think he he has earned the right to be the next one after? These guys finally settle things. Maybe it's it. You know why it's so weird? It's been an answer. It's because everyone has lost to each other. Yeah. At the top, Brandon Royvels has beaten Kai Kara France, but he's lost in the pan. He's lost to Pantoja, but Pantoja has also lost to Askarov. Well, he also lost to Moreno. And then, and then Alex Perez, he he was he had the last shot before this all went down and lost to Figueroa. He's also been out of action for a bit. I mean, I don't know who you give it to. Maybe you make Cara France and Royville fight it, fight again, and the winner of that goes and, and fights. I don't know. It's kind of locked. I know you're always there. looking for ways to get a bonus for Royville. I there. would like to get him some some <laughs> title money. <laughs> I I think probably there's there's enough momentum behind Cara France right now that he he at the moment looks like he makes a lot of sense as the next guy. 
or maybe someone falls out and is injured or something like that, and they either do a regular title shot against him if it's uh, if Figueredo stays in, or if Figueredo gets hurt, then it could be an interim fight against Moreno or something like that. I'm not calling for interim title fights because they're stupid, but I'm saying this is what they would do. And the thing is, Kai Kai France, I think he's just getting really, he's just improving a lot. He is. So he's I, grown. And and he came in with, with a lot of interest when he got to the UFC. He so can, he's, he's kind of realizing something that a lot of people, and similar to Alexa Grasso, so realizing potential people had kind of assigned to them. Could could City kickbox and get a third champ? They could. That'd be pretty wild. Can't rule it out. Flyweight's very interesting. Especially when they leave these things in, uh, in <laughs> not to be not to be condescending, but leave it in the hands of the judges. When when you have flyweights in there, there is a lot that can happen, and it's a very hard, uh, challenging. I should, I would say, I guess, uh, weight class to judge because a lot of them are throwing a ton of stuff out there, and they don't hit as hard. Yeah. <laughs> so it's always harder to read impact. You know, this is this is something I've heard from officials before, and it seems to bear out based on the stats too. Yeah, because I mean, all, it, if these guys did this at heavyweight, they'd be dead. Correct. So and tired, <laughs> and dead tired. Yes. <laughs> but but you know, speaking of the judging though, the, we have to highlight the fact that twenty seven rounds had to be turned in for this one. A lot of decisions uh, in Columbus, uh, and we only had one first round finish. So everything got just about everything had a round turned in. Twenty five out of twenty seven. Rounds were in agreement among all three judges. That's that's a that's an incredible. Even even if you want to say okay, maybe some of the fights just happened to have uh, rounds that were maybe sl- clearer than others. Because yeah, that can happen. Like there's there's certain randomness to this kind of thing. But first two fights were razor close fights. Yeah, I mean so. they were, they still ended up on the same page in fights like that. So you, you we gotta highlight it. I I don't know what the percentage is. Twenty five out of twenty seven. It's very very high. Uh, we do quick math for me. Dave. Yeah, I can do some yeah. math for you. So twenty five out of twenty seven, like 20. I said. Uh, the two dissents, by the way, the dissenting judges in each fight were the local judges. Uh, incidentally, they were Todd Schwarz and Andrew uh, Andy Atkins. Ninety two point six percent. That's a really strong, and and for a lot of rounds too. And for only five guys working. That's right. We we had a, a very uh tight rotation of the judges here yeah we had the two locals who i mentioned and then we had eric cologne sal d'amato and mike bell were uh they came into town into ohio and so when you have five officials you always have someone who's going to be working back to back at the very least yeah not long breaks nope and it was interesting because if you notice uh when the scorecards were being posted by the ufc uh the judges who were sitting in I think in the red seat, no, in in the blue seat, I want to say, for the previous fight, the next fight, they would sit in the red seat. That was just like, okay. that was the pattern that I picked up upon uh, that Ohio had done. Although there was one fight that was canceled, the uh, the Ilya Latifi against uh, Alexei Olenek fight. That was canceled, so that kind of threw off the pattern. But I, 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 I'm going to just take a stab in the dark that that probably was going to happen there, too. Mm. Um yeah, it was it was a little it was funny. It was interesting. I actually like that pattern though, yeah. Because it seems it seems Nevada, you get the same seat based on alphabetical order. Yeah. So yeah, that seems to be the case. I, well, I think a lot of UFC shows they tend to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, pro- probably anytime the UFC is in charge with Mark Ratner, and then probably anytime they're in Nevada, that would be my okay. guess, which covers a a, a large margin. Uh, to borrow a criteria word, uh, of the rounds or of the uh, of the events. I should say in the UFC, <laughs> uh, but but yeah, strong strong going by the judges there. Also, they had a local judge, uh, one of the two local judges on every single fight. No breaks for them, which oh. I think honestly I, I liked that. Uh, even when I kind of figured that out earlier on, because they should get reps. Oh yeah, but but to have them on with two other experienced judges, typically coming in from out of town. Uh, most in most cases, at the very least, it seemed like a very smart way to do it. Yeah, that was. Why not have your guys doing some? Because yeah, I mean that that's the experience. So. That's the tricky thing is like when they go to somewhere like Texas, they end up. I feel like they go crazy with their local officials and they don't bring in enough outside talent. Uh, and then I, I don't want to say other place. I think other places do a good job too. Um, but yeah, you you definitely want to get the reps in for these officials, right? They they if you're gonna create mm-hmm. stronger officiating in other territories, you need to have them experience the pressure cooker of the UFC. Um, it, it's and a then, different it's a different level. And I I think it's good to put them with with 
have them not on the same fight. Absolutely. As far Absolutely. as because if they're if they're dissenting as they were in this case, you know, and, and I, I think when we get into the contested rounds, which are about two in a minute for these two rounds here, they're close rounds. I don't think anything yeah. was crazy, but, but the, as it turned out, the two dissents were the local judges. The the traveling judges were always on the same page. Every single time. And that's that like almost because they're of. always together, they calibrate and everything together. I would have to think it that's a strong be. part of so, it. Yeah. It's gotta be. But yeah, like I was like you you put the two traveling guys who have more experience there with one of the local guys. So you have somewhat of a margin of error mm-hmm. in case things go awry. But I think tw- 25 out of 27 speaks speaks volume. So Yeah, I you know, the, the two officials, uh, again, uh, Judges Schwarz and, and uh, Atkins, I think they, they acquitted themselves very well. You know, even even though they were, again, on the out on these two rounds, which we'll talk about. Uh, you know, let's get into contested rounds now, right? You know, also, Rook, we had Gary Copeland as one of the referees. We did, yeah. yeah it, was, it was funny. They, Mini Brock Lesnar, right? Is said, that what they call him? So Yeah, someone said, oh, he doesn't skip leg day. And then Bisping's like, oh, I don't think he skips shoulder day, chest day, any day. Yeah. He's just, and then, of course, DC turned it into wrestling. Yes, it's like, he yeah, does. He looks like he's going to power double someone. Okay. Well, he's he's still on the high from Gable Stevenson from last he is, week. Yeah, I, Try, and, yeah. and then trying to Cut do a run in with him at uh, at WrestleMania, which he was pitching. <laughs> Come on, DC, chill. Anyway, it's gonna happen eventually. DC will be on at WrestleMania he, at he, some point. He's gonna try and force a will yeah. it. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, let's go to contested rounds, though, Dan. We got these two rounds here. We don't know too much. Uh, let's start with one of the best fights of this entire year. Uh, and this the entire year is only a quarter of the year, but. One of the best fights of this quarter of the year, <laughs> Dan, Brian Barbarina getting the win over Matt Brown, split decision, 29-28s all around, so two for Bre- Barbarina, one for Matt Brown, uh, who was had the crowd very solidly behind him this entire fight, by the way. Uh, very much energized by that, and I think that probably gave him a lot of uh, strength to carry on as he was getting tired. Uh, at parts of this fight, visibly so. Round three is where we're talking about, because we got round one was Brown, round two was Barbarina, and now here is where it gets interesting. So, Dan, take us through round three. Yeah, this was a slugfest of a round. Uh, I think early, I think it's actually pretty clear based on impact that, that Brown is winning. But Barbarina is definitely landing more he, volume-wise. He's, he's got the numbers, I think. Uh, Brown does get a couple takedowns during the round. It's a dirty fight. Both are landing pretty good elbows in the clinch. Uh, I think the ones that Brown's landing feel a little bit harder. But Barbarino, he's in there. He keeps throwing. Barbarina, not not Vinny Barbarino. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Bar- Barbarina <laughs> is still throwing and landing. He's landing more. I, I think the numbers are probably going to show that Barbarina definitely threw and landed more in the round. They just don't feel as effective to me. I think the final 10 seconds is what really makes this round tough because Barbarina empties the gas tank, and I think he's landing some really good shots here, and Brown's not returning kind of just waiting he heard the clacker kind of just like oh, this round's gonna be over soon my problem was i had a hard time differentiating between is, is brown hurt or is brown gassed and i kind of felt he was more gassed than hurt so by the slimmest of margins i'm 10-9 matt brown well uh, i guess the question you have to kind of get to is is matt is brian barbarina diminishing matt brown is he diminishing his opponent I don't know. I think so. I do think he is. Okay. With with each, especially at the very end, mm. um, because I I was already starting to see momentum start to swing that way. You know, I think you touched upon that too, right? Um, you're starting to see the momentum at least head in the direction of Barbarino over that last, you know, let, let's say, two minutes ish. Mm-hmm. You know, but in that final, yeah, tenish seconds or so, he's got Matt Brown. I don't know if quite on the ropes. That's probably just a little too far, but he's hurt. I mean, he's in just a little bit of a, a rough way here, you know? Yeah, I know. That was my thing, though. I don't know if is he in a rough way because he's getting punched in the face or is he in a rough way because he's just been in a three-round war he's and getting, is absolutely just gassed. He's getting landed clean on it, They man. are landed clean. I, yeah. I, think, I think those reactions are strong enough that I felt good enough to go that way. Okay. But it, we're talking about something that is maybe a little harder to parse through. Um, I'm curious what a judge would say about kind of the conundrum you have, you know, being are you tired on your own versus are you tired or diminished because of what your opponent's doing? I'm curious how a judge would say is the right way to kind of react to that or is mm. it just totally interpretation? I don't know. We should um, find out in July. We could. Yeah. We should probably make like a list of questions that we ought to be asking people <laughs> um, and then just, you know, monopolizing the time that everyone else is there to try and learn from. Uh, 
<laughs> uh, make it about us. It's it's always about us. We're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do that. We're we're cool. Um, <laughs> maybe we can get a live show. A live show? Yeah, like maybe they'll like set out like an hour for us, and we can just do like a live podcast. No, nah, I don't see it no, happening, bro. That'd be pretty awesome. I mean, sure. If you you want to. <laughs> Look, if you want to try, ask Mazzuli what he thinks about that. The ABC, fine, but I, I don't see it happening. The 2022 ABC conference, you know, presented by Couchside Judges. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure we have to pay to get live that sponsor, on, don't live we? Live on ESPN. We have to pay somebody. We don't have a budget. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, like, uh, we'll, we'll buy a Domino's. <laughs> that's, that's, that's our budget. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but yeah, so to get back to this round, I did have this round for Barbarina, but it, it really is so, it, it was so tough. I, I felt like, cause whenever you flip in the last few seconds, you're like, man, am I giving too much weight? That's, that's mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, I, I wrote down my number. I, I had what I, I had my number, but then like mm-hmm. you start to think, am I doing that? Am I giving too much weight to the end mm-hmm. thing? But I, you know, I've had time to wa- I watched it again with you, mm-hmm. uh, just before we got on here and, and I do still feel pretty solid. I, I, I stand by my score. Yeah. You I know, mean, I think. Think as any good judge fine. does it's i'm not a good judge but i'm gonna stand by it anyway the, <laughs> the tide was for sure turning yeah in barbarina's favor and i don't think i'm i don't think i'm like trying to say oh you know save by the bell you get because you, you oh, have no. to you have to stop you have to stop once once those five minutes end that's how it's been explained to us by officials before the five minutes end that's it. You can't interpret what have, would have happened after. Yeah. It's what you had. But I do think it turned enough. Just barely. Okay. So that's where I went. So I was on the same page as uh, Eric Colon and Sal D'Amato. And you were on the same page with uh, Matt Brown as Todd Schwarz. And I, I used to go to FAO Schwarz. Yeah? Yeah. Do you think he is a family member? I sure doubt it. <laughs> I never heard that before. I, I sure doubt it. I don't know. It's two what thirty about, in the morning. Wait, Whoa, what, what about, are you freaking out about? What's what about on? Bruce Buffer <laughs> throwing everyone through loops with the way he was announcing decisions? Uh, what was he saying? Again, I do kind of remember he's, this being off. He would start saying it like it's going to be a split, and he's like, you know, the judges go. We go to a, you know, judges a score scorecard cards. for a decision twenty nine twenty, or the judges score it twenty nine twenty eight for whatever. But then he's saying all three judges score it twenty nine twenty eight. It, it was he was throwing it out to the point where he was saying things the way he would start a split decision and then be like, "Nope, we all got it that way. Fooled you guys." Yeah, I I remember it being a little weird. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I will say this: there there was at least the comforts of home where uh, we heard Sal Diamato's name. Yes, and, and Eric Cullen. Yes, Eric Cullen. <laughs> Come on, Bruce. Hey, you know what? He ain't gonna get it right. <laughs> It's not Derek, happening. Derek clearly. It's not happening. No, no, no. None of these none of these names are getting right. It's just a, Mike Bell, at least there's I don't think there's a way to mess that up. It's impossible. Are you I mean Mike Beal? Beal? <laughs> Bell Bell You pronounce both L's? Bell 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 L. Mike Bell. Mike Bell Muhammad. Yeah. <laughs> Bell Muhammad. Anyway. Uh <laughs> We're going off the rails. The other fight, the other split decision here, the only other round that we have to talk about for contested rounds. I can't remember many times where we've had just two from the UFC card, especially with this many. This has to be really one of the strongest nights from the UFC, judging wise, in a while. I, I was hoping I, we had. Unanimous. I really have to think. Hmm? I was hoping it was a unanimous course. No, play. no, no. Because what are we going to talk about? Pinewood Derby, which we will. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Scott got it in there again. Oh, we'll get it in. I will, we'll get it in before we leave. I, I'll update you guys on the status of my Pinewood Derby card. But let's get to this other round. Neil Magny getting the win over Max Griffin. Uh, another split decision again. 29-28s all around. Round two this time is our split because we have kind of the uh, the changing momentum kind of deal with uh, with Griffin winning the first. Magny winning the third, and then in round two, we started to see things swing Magny's way in this round. But, Dan, why don't you go a little deeper into what happened? Uh, yeah. Uh, Magny comes out. He's really not doing much. He's throwing some of those, like, those flip kicks. Oh, wow. I banged the microphone. Careful with that. Easy on your ears, guys. I apologize. Um, Magny's doing those, like, straight kicks to the stomach, a couple jabs, nothing too impactful. But I think Griffin's landing pretty solidly for, like, at least the first half of the round. And I even questioned, I said, are you sure you got the rounds right? That were... I said I did. And you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm 100% mm-hmm. sure on this because round three is an absolute one-sided beatdown. It sure was. Um, and on cue, Neil Magny hears me back in time and starts landing some 
really good shots at this point. And I, I thought for a split moment that Griffin seemed to be on skates. I was like, oh, is he hurt? But he recovered quick if he was even there. But I, I, th- I do think he was a bit hurt there. Uh, and then the rest of the rounds, I think, is pretty even. Uh, I give it to Magny based on the impact. Uh, another close round. All right. I went the other way again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had it. I had it for Griffin. I I did weigh a little more heavily what he had what he did earlier in the round. Okay, that's about it. I don't really have much more to say. This was a really close round. This I thought this was even more challenging for me to do than the Barbarina one because when when the Barbarina one happened, I felt very strongly like yes, now I'm on the other side, even though it was super close. This one, it's kind of just like man, this is a really close one. I guess I'm still on Griffin. Okay. Yeah. I, mean, I don't have I much guess, more to it. I guess it's kind of it's kind of good or not good. I wouldn't say good, but it's kind of uh, interesting. The two rounds that the, the pros were split on, we also were split on. Yes, indeed. I don't think that happens too often. No, as I as I sit here yawning, yeah. it's it's very late in the night. I worked. <laughs> yeah, look at that. I worked too. Did you? I had a great time. Working. Oh well, that's right. You you did your optional side your, yeah. your side hustle. I had a, these people were they were having a, the time of their life. They tip well. They did for a game you typically don't get tips at. So uh, there you go. It was a, a fun night. Did you, you, you know wear something skimpy or? I wore my very awesome card tie. Card tie, and that's it. And a black vest. Oh, okay, good. You, you. I was saying yes. you wear something skimpy. You know, maybe you got mm-hmm. tips that way. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure who you're playing with. No judgments. <laughs> no judgments, please. Uh, but yeah, so I ended up siding with uh, Andrew Atkins, the local judge, and you had Mike Bell and Eric Cologne. In your corner. Look at that. Or you were in the corner of them, because they were the ones that matter, and we're just talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> that is all. Again, we just had two rounds. Uh, again, super awesome job, I think, from the judges. I don't think anything here is anything. Anyone went home saying, man, what the heck is going on? Except there were some people complaining about that What that first fight, right? Uh, there was a lot of people. Just, just the better. The, the gambling community was yeah. not happy. Well, they're with, never. Uh, are they ever happy if they lose? N- yeah, usually not. No, <laughs> because, you know, the thing is, they're scoring biased. Yes. So, there there always will be. Um, but yeah, so we had four finishes though on this one. Like I said, a lot of decisions, two TKO finishes, two sub finishes, and one first round finish. The one from Alexa Grasso. What of those four choices, sir, was your favorite? Yeah, I like Grasso uh, getting the win over Wood. Uh, mainly, I mean, I could have won either way. I could have gave Kizriev uh, his, but I thought the you know the quality of opponent Alexa Grasso doing that to Joanne Wood was pretty. Uh, pretty impressive so and for her first submission That's victory a, yes he, someone who doesn't you know get the sub at least not in practice yeah yeah she got she got it against a, a high caliber opponent so although one who you know granted i would say if you're gonna beat uh by finish joanne wood it's well the, yeah. the more likely that it's going to be by sub oh uh, yeah but she, not that it could do the other way too but her biggest win and the other guy did not look like a minus 1250 favorite until he did but yeah definitely in the first round did not look like it what about you for me, it was uh, Chris Gutierrez. That was a that was a good fight. Spinning back fist sets up the finish on on the ground in round two of uh, it's it's Bakary Dana, not Dana Bakary. Allegedly, I don't know. I I I I always try to I always strive for correctness with especially with people's names, how to pronounce them, how to spell them, uh, how to order the uh, family name and given name. Uh, he's Mongolian. I don't, I don't know what the naming convention is there, and I don't know that the UFC seemed to know because they had it one way before, and now they do not They, yeah, they they keep flip flopping. Yeah, so it's very confusing. So, <laughs> uh, but over over that guy, Chris Gutierrez, finish of that guy. Um, uh, that was that was a <laughs> who's big, a very good fighter. It, yeah, so. and and honestly, and Bakary won the first round too. So yes. on, on all three cards, he, he stole the first round. He did. He sl- got him to the ground, and he just started slamming mm-hmm. in the face. That guy hits hard. Yes, yes, yeah. We knew that going into this one that he hits hard because he had, I think he had three straight first round finishes, which you're not seeing at 135 pounds in the UFC very often. Mm -mm. And did you know Chris Gutierrez was from Jersey City? You know, it sounds vaguely familiar, but no, I don't think I really like had retained the information, if anything else. John Annex mentioned it. I've been working on a list of, for work purposes, I'm trying to make a list of fighters with local connections, you know, whether it's, you know, North Jersey is especially, uh, like Westchester, New York City, Long Island. I'm trying to make a list of like those kind of connections for us. Probably even like, (laughs) I don't know how much of a thriving mixed martial arts community there is in like 
Southern Connecticut and Greenwich and Stamford, but you know, if there's anyone that comes out of there, mm. you know, maybe from the mean streets of Greenwich, <laughs> um, in the part of the mean street, main, start of the mean street posse, which apparently at least one or two of those guys were from Jersey too. Okay, um, but uh, like this area too. I think Rodney is from this area. I think he's got a business okay. in like Lodi or something. Um, shout out, shout out to Rodney, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jersey. But yeah, so I didn't. I think I knew that there was a connection there. Okay, because mm-hmm. yeah, John Anik mentioned he's the Jersey City native, and I was like, oh, this is a great weekend for Jersey City. That's right. Like, well, depending when you're listening to it, could be a heartbreak. Uh, if it's la- late Sunday, honestly, not, so St. Peter's College. We're talking. <laughs> this is what Dan is referring to in the NCAA men's basketball tournament. Uh, I had someone ask me, "Oh, are you watching the NCAA tournament?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, my bracket's doing right." They're like, "Oh no, I'm at the wrestling one. This was last weekend." I'm like. Oh, I wasn't thinking about that one. <laughs> and I know I I realistically should be thinking about that one probably more than than I do, but also I'm just, I don't really come from a wrestling background. I follow like I follow MMA. I don't watch every Taekwondo tournament either, you know. Mm. I understand and respect the wrestling amateur wrestling community. My I got a cousin who actually wrestles for uh uh Binghamton. Okay. Yeah. Um, pretty pretty standout wrestler. I don't think actually. So he's he's still young. I think he's a sophomore. He's not really competing that much for them right now. But but he was uh I mean, he was he was one of the best in the state when nice. he was a kid. Anyway, um yeah. So apparently to go all the way back here, the St. Peter's College, uh, Jersey City has just been tearing it up at the NCAA level. They're in the Elite Eight. If they win on Sunday, they go to the Final Four. They have to beat North Carolina, who is actually in a down year. But if you're in North Carolina and you're in an Elite Eight matchup, you never think you're the, not going to be the underdog as as the A team. Sure. Like now they're the favorite. Mm-hmm. Like they got to be ecstatic. Like St. Peter's is playing with house money, it, so yeah. I think there's no way that this is heartbreak for them. It's good. There's gonna. I be, mean, there will I mean, be some heartbreak. Sure, be they will be disappointed. Sure. They lose, but but I think the world will look upon them as one of the greatest overachieving stories, like in sports history. What's the furthest a 15 seed's gone? Or what's, what's the highest seed? Here. This is it? Here. Oh, wow. A 13 hasn't gone this far. A 14 hasn't gone so this far. So this is the highest there seed. There have only been two f- 12s who got this far, one of which was last year. Okay. And there's also a 10 in here, too. Miami. That's so. right. Miami hadn't gotten this far before either. So, I mean, imagine a Miami versus St. Peter's finals. That's what I want. <laughs> That'd be I'm rooting crazy. for that right now. Because my bracket's just a total, <laughs> it, it's just a train wreck. It was so good. And then it, then Gonzaga lost. And I was like, well, I'm not going to look anymore. <laughs> at least not at the standings but now now i just want the peacocks to win go peacocks yeah uh yeah i mean that that's it though i mean we don't really have anything more for ufc columbus we're, we're, we're going way off topic obviously so there's not even a ufc there's not even a bellator this coming weekend sir no but we, we might have something right we're, we're trying to work on something we're, we're trying to figure out a, uh hopefully an interesting show that we could do uh for you guys in an off week that pro- may, may not even involve um Past judgment, which we often do in in kind of our off weeks, we've got something else we're trying to do. So we'll see. Yeah, it would be if it works out. I think you'll enjoy it a lot. I think so too. I think so, so too. Uh, but real quick, of course, before we go, because I turned this last week into a Pinewood Derby <laughs> podcast. I think you all want to know at least an update of of my son's car, which is uh, the competition is Sunday. So you're listening to this on Sunday. If you're listening to it day of release. You're not knowing how we do in that. I'll update that, of course, next week. But the car is phenomenal. It's brown. The young lad drew uh, squares on a brown car to make it look like a Hershey bar. All right. Yep. Yeah. Number 36 on it. It is called Chocolaka 36. So get your Chocolaka 36 merch uh, at our store. Where did 36 come from? Any, uh, he any... started writing yeah. the number thirty six, okay. and that's how it happened. Nice. I right. I don't know. I don't even know why he picked it. <laughs> he just started writing a number. <laughs> okay. And then he wrote the six backwards. He he often transposes the the number, writes them okay. backwards. Um, it's it's very common at kids of that age. So uh, we're not even concerned with it. But I was like, "Do you sure you want to write it backwards, buddy?" He's like, "Oh no." So we wiped it, and then we did it again. Okay. <laughs> so he's got thirty six on it. And uh. We should mention that it officially made weight. It did officially make weight. Yeah, he had to he had to cut an extra pound. Or, <laughs> excuse me, an extra, not an extra pound, an extra tenth of a pound off this car. So we had to dremel it out. Uh, there were some helpers there at the impound on Saturday where he picked up his driver's license, which was very cool for him, and his pouch or <laughs> pouch his patch for Pinewood Derby, so he could put on his uh, his little 
Cub Scout uniform. And uh, yeah, so we, we shaved just a little bit of wood off the bottom. Uh, and I had to assure him, like, don't worry, we'll, we'll paint over it when we get home after the competition. Because I didn't want him to be upset that, you know, he's, he cared more about his car's look than he did about mm-hmm. the the winning the race. Let's face it. That's really how he felt. So, But he wants both. He he just wants, he just wants you know, it, if he can only have one, he wants to look. What, what does Dion say? If you look good, you feel good. You feel good, you play good. That, that was a Dion saying, right? Sure. We'll go with it. Yeah. I believe it. I mean, I could live by that, too. And I think we are good here, Dan. So uh, thanks for listening, everybody. We will be back, like I said, next week with uh, with with non judging, or at least not non live judging related, right? Yeah, and it'll, it'll be officiating uh, centric, I would imagine. Though, uh, yeah. So yeah. And obviously, of course, it'll be Pinewood Derby centric. <laughs> yes, too, that's it. We'll find. <laughs> <laughs> let you know how we do. Yeah, on, on a on a show, we only had two co- to- rounds to talk about. We got a lot in there. Huh? We did. Thanks for listening, everybody. Take care.